Welcome to the Keeping the Nostalgia Alive show. I am your host, Billy. You're watching this on our YouTube channel, Keeping the Nostalgia Alive show. Please subscribe to it. Uh, you can also go on Facebook and just type in Keeping the Nostalgia Alive. You're going to see several pages, uh, uh, sports, uh, the Hoosier, the state of Indiana, uh, Hoosier hysteria, Indiana basketball memories, basketball, baseball, football, Keeping the Nostalgia Alive. Please uh, like, subscribe, follow, whatever they call it now. Um, if you would like that to keep the nostalgia alive. Um, so last week we had Paul Page on, who was the uh, main Indianapolis 500 announcer for a 10 year period. Um, uh, and he had wrote a book that we discussed last week. And we talked a little bit about uh, uh, him and movie stars, you know, James Garner from the Rockford Files, Paul Newman. And uh, it's always interesting to hear um, uh, those stories. And that was my first racing story. So, you know, when I was a, when I was little, you know how sometimes you not might not be related by blood or family, but you feel and care for them. And uh, you can also feel that connection reciprocated. Well, it's a long story, but maybe for an ancestry show. Uh, but that's how I feel about my uncle Joe. So full disclosure, um, uh, it's uh, six degrees of separation on how we are related, but, uh, I, I really feel true that, you know, there's some people who have brothers that are so far apart and they, you wouldn't think they were brothers or they're just brothers by blood. I'm not with this gentleman, but he is, he is my uncle Joe and, uh, I, I love him and I feel the love back from him. So full disclosure, uh, I'm, I have my uncle Joe Ritma who worked for 37 years for NASA uh, he was, if I'm not mistaken, former Michigan control flight controller for payloads, experiments, and the shuttle arm. Did I get that correct? Uh, all that's correct. There's more, but that's correct. Also, uh, we had all the mechanical systems on the show. Well, see, I, 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 I got lost a little bit after I had to read aeronautical and astronautical engineering. Just say aerospace. It's a whole lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> but but still, you know, and, and when you when you think about space and you think about you get, you know ground control, the Major Tom from David Bowie, and I think of Danger Will Robinson with the robot uh, waving his arms. Growing up, you you first started out in North Carolina, South Carolina. Is that correct? That's where I was born. Yes. And then you, you, you um, got to Indianapolis as fast as you could. And uh, what, what, you know, what was the first memory you had about watching something on TV about space, something in the news, something, was it something in the newspaper? Was it a TV show or movie related? Or what's that first thing that, that grabbed you about space exploration or, you know, a, a NASA it was books. I got I got started reading um, science fiction books, probably in junior high, and I read a ton of science fiction books. And um, then, of course, the space program got going, and uh, the TV shows or the news really broadcast so much of the space program stuff that that really captured my attention from the from that media perspective but did really you, the first thing was books did did you what did you want to be when you grew up did you want to be a cowboy did you want to be a train engineer did you did you want to be an astronaut did you want to work for the space program well in um, elementary school I really wanted to be a veterinarian and then um, once I got into science fiction and such then I, I decided I wanted to be an astronaut so that was my goal was to get an education, go to work for NASA and get into the astronaut corps. So, yep, I want to be astronaut. So reading science fiction and wanting to be an astronaut and when did the analyst didn't when did you decide that, you know, I'm very analytical or I can take this apart and I can put this back together, um, you know, of what and what is the true definition of engineering oh my goodness um uh, 
engineering isn't necessarily taking things apart and putting them back together again. Engineering is using uh, math and physics and chemistry and all the applied sciences to um, design, um, develop, test um, things. <laughs> uh, where a uh, it's where somebody that just takes things apart and put them back together again, that, that's more of a, a mechanic kind of skill, you know, which you got to have both to actually build something and maintain it. Um, so that's engineering is, is all the disciplines that go into um, design and test and maintenance type things. Um, and you wanted to know, when did I think I was analytic enough to do that? When, <laughs> when I started college, uh, they told me I had about a 40% chance of graduating from that program, from the aerospace program, so that I really ought to pick another field, which, which uh, convinced me that, okay, I'm gonna prove you guys wrong. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how I, I wound up in there. Um, I always, I would always get in trouble for taking things apart and not being able to put them together again. <laughs> One time we were about to go on vacation and uh, dad's loading the car. And I got curious about how does a door latch work on the car door? And I inadvertently triggered the door latch. So now the door couldn't close on the car. And here we are about to pull out of the driveway and. And I have to go confess to dad that I just broke the door in the car. <laughs> as, you, as you can imagine, dad was not real thrilled with me. But he fixed it and off we went. <laughs> well, who, who knows? We know we know how uh, uh, your father uh, uh, used to apply the brakes. So that may gave you a window of opportunity that you guys uh, didn't get into because you spent that time fixing the door back. That could very well be the case. <laughs> uh, uh, Joe, tell us about your background. Tell us the background that people are seeing right now. Mission Control uh, from Johnson Space Center, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, and uh, tell us a little bit of history about the uh, the, the background that you have uh, on your screen. Well, that uh, the background I picked because you had questions you wanted to ask about the shuttle program. I thought this would be fun background. Um, it is the old mission control, which today, this is at Johnson Space Center. I believe today it's named the Chris Kraft uh, Mission Control Center after Christopher Kraft, who was the first in developing that. Um, it is set up to be, to be in the same configuration as it was for the uh, moon landing. That is a historical area. It's a historical site now that visitors can go see if you go visit the Space Center Houston. Um, and um, everything is set up as close to that as they possibly could. Um, it changes configuration from the Mercury days to the Gemini, to the Apollo, and then to the shuttle program. And it was in the shuttle program time frame that I worked in it. And it consoles moved around and capabilities changed um, uh, on the console specific. Um, and uh, consoles themselves are just amazing pieces of equipment. Um, you almost have to see them to believe how, how complex and amazing they really are. It is the, the con Mission control behind you, is that something that was taught at Purdue or is that something that, you know, someone who comes out with a degree and, and wants to work for NASA and wants to work for the Space Administration learns after a little bit of repetition? Is it something that they already know a little bit about or is this something that you're, you, you're, you have to learn when you start a new job? 
Uh, to, it, the short answer is you have to learn it. Um, what uh, engineering programs teach are the principles of engineering. Mission control is um, uh, operations, um, where engineering is usually more around the, the area of design, development, test, um, where uh, mission control is operating. You actually use it. And the concept was to, to get engineers who understood the uh, various systems on the shuttle to uh, monitor them and, and work with the crews to uh, make sure they're trained uh, and to be able to uh, respond to any contingencies in the event of a, of a problem on, in orbit. Um, plus the, the operation guys uh, had to learn how the systems functioned and, and what, they, what was a healthy system and when, when a system was a problem. Um, so it was, it, was, it was not really an engineering discipline that is taught in school, but it's, a, it's, it's operations, like flying airplanes type thing is operations. Did you have another school that you could have gone to besides Purdue? Why is Purdue so special when it comes to producing what it takes to run NASA? And what, if there was another school, what was your percentage or your chance of going to that? And what cemented your going to Purdue? When I applied to college, <clears throat> I applied to IU, to um, Indiana State, and to Purdue. <clears throat> but really, Purdue was the only one that had the better engineering school. And that was pretty much um, um, encouraged to me by my dad. And Purdue also had what was called a cooperative education program where, <clears throat> where you would go to school a semester and you would work a semester um, in the engineering field. And so that enabled me at Purdue, which was one of the reasons why I chose it, to go um, in the cooperative education program to NASA. Uh, and I had been offered a position, a co-op position at, um, at uh, Huntsville um, Marshall Space Flight Center and at Johnson Space Flight Center. And Johnson had the, the allure, so I, I chose that. And at the time, it was actually called the Manned Space Flight Center. <clears throat> um, because uh, Lyndon Johnson was still living and they didn't name it after him until after he passed. So to answer your question was, dad encouraged me to go to Purdue as an engineering school. And he also encouraged me to get into the cooperative education program. And Purdue at the time had the largest um, aeronautical and astronautical engineering department in the, in the nation at that time. I've lived in the Houston area for 22, 23 years, I guess. And it's, uh, you know, whenever you find someone that says they went to Purdue, their, your next question was, uh, uh, do you live in Alvin? Do you live in Clear Lake? Did you work for NASA? <laughs> um, how, <laughs> this is going to be a loaded question and a dumb question, but uh, I was told several times yesterday while I was working on a, an electrical product in the house that there's no dumb questions. So, what, how hard was it to get through Purdue? And what did you find as the challenges of uh, working and being a student? And, and I'm sorry, everybody, I did not put this on my list of questions I sent him. So this is a curveball that I'm throwing him. I struggled going through Purdue. Um, as you can imagine, since they told me there was only a 40% chance of me being able to graduate. Uh, make it through the program. The first year, uh, they had uh, had take chemistry and physics and calculus, and it seemed uh, to me like those were uh, classes meant to weed out the faint of heart. Um, and uh, I found that the co-op program gave me a break from school. 
and I think it actually helped me get through school because I would go to school for a semester and then I get to go work for a semester doing amazing and fun things and be around just phenomenal people um, and then go back to uh, Purdue where I had a, a much um, stronger sense of self-esteem and confidence that I could actually uh, perform <clears throat> and, and do well in school. And so that's kind of how it was for me. I don't know if that answers your question exactly. At, at what point you, you were at Purdue or in your education where you knew that you weren't going to be the astronaut when you were a kid and when did it grab on that you that's what you wanted to do though was to work for nasa and well i i wanted to work for nasa from the get-go before i even started purdue <clears throat> um I, you can't i couldn't apply to the astronaut program till after i graduated so i was already working in houston when i applied <clears throat> And uh, I was pretty sure I didn't stand a chance when I realized, even though the um, criteria to be to be an astronaut candidate was just a bachelor of science degree, I realized that they were only picking people with masters and higher, and mostly their PhDs for the science slots. Um, the commander and pilot were all selected out of the military, which wasn't for me. So, um, and then those that they chose out of the um, science world were people who were very top of their field, people who were <clears throat> internationally known for their, their field. Um, for instance, one guy comes to mind is uh, Dr. Carl Hennies who's since passed, but uh, Hennais Carl was the leading astronomer uh, in the world on the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so I realized that it would be a long time before I would ever uh, get a chance to be an astronaut. And then, then I realized um, that astronaut life was not what I actually wanted to live. Uh, they had a very tough life and it was tough on their families. And, uh, and if you didn't, weren't one of the top of, uh, astronaut, your life could be pretty miserable. Do you consider like the right stuff or just this last movie about Neil Armstrong? Do you consider some of the space movies or biographical uh, historical movies that are made to, to, because as soon as you said the astronaut's life and, and it's not, basically you said it's not very fun. It's a little difficult. Uh, uh, did you see it explained that way uh, for the normal layman who's watching those movies to get an idea of what it's really like to be an astronaut? Well, I have to say, I haven't seen those movies. Um, what, um, but what I do know about movies um, is, um, well, Ron Howard did Apollo 13 and um, Jim Lovell, uh, we were talking to him and Lovell said that uh, some of those things that Ron put into the movies, into that movie, didn't really happen that way. And um, so he said, I, as a technical advisor, I went to Ron and said, you know, hey, we never panicked like that. This, you know, none of this stuff really happened that much. And Ron said, well, you guys would sit there with a stone face, no emotion and do things and make decisions. That is a boring movie. And you can't communicate to the audience the, the, the feelings that go along with the movie, unless you make the people and the events into more of a caricature of the, um, of the event. And so a lot of, most of the movies out there are uh, caricatures of the events in order 
to make the movie interesting. Um, probably the, the, the movie that I thought was the most accurate was, um, what's it called? Um, Mission Control, The Unsung Heroes. Um, and they interview the actual um, flight controllers who um, got built Mission Control, got it started and worked the Apollo 13. Um, that was, that's a very clear, accurate picture of that one tiny part of the overall program. NASA as a, as a program is huge. It goes from um, finance people, from um, design, development, test engineers to um, the people that build the, the flight hardware to design and build the flight hardware. Um, the, uh, it's, just, it's just huge. And those people, everyone is critical to a, a successful mission. Unfortunately, um, it's the astronauts that seem to get all the, all the glory, kind of like on a, on a sports team with a football player, the quarterback is you know, when, when you see the, the the advertising for a big game, they talk about this quarterback battling the other quarterback. But the fact of the matter is the two quarterbacks are never on the field at the same time. It's always the quarterback against the defense or the defense against the quarterback. And and there's a whole lot of other people involved in, in winning a game than just a quarterback. And, you know, for the... Um... Uh, I'm going to use the word layman again, or someone that's just uh, learning about the, um, the space program. Can you give me or us a little bit of the history of the, uh, you know, space program? I, I would say from my, it, it's, did it start with uh, uh, Eisenhower or would you say because of the speech that President John F. Kennedy gave, it started then? Well, actually it, it kind of started back in the early 1900s. I wrote down a date. Let's see. Um, I think it started with, um, oh, NACA, NACA, in 1915. After World War I, uh, one, um, in, after, well, after the Wright brothers, and then going into World War One, the country found themselves lagging in um, in aer in aero uh, aerodynamics, aerospace kind of aeronautics. Aeronautics that's the word we're trying to come up with. And so they they implemented NACA, which became a a huge research development test organization um, uh, for airplanes. They in school, in the aero, aero school, they uh, you learn the NACA uh, wing shapes and drag coefficients for various wings and all that kind of stuff. Um, that came out of NACA. Well, then, and NACA was a, a military funded, uh, came out of military budget and was under the military. I believe a, a, a Navy guy was the head of it. And then when Kennedy wanted to, well, then uh, the Russians, we were in the Cold War with Russians and Russians were putting up um, that Sputnik. And all of a sudden we realized that, oh my gosh, the Russians are ahead of us in space. And that's a strategic place to be. That uh, we tried to compete with them and the Russians kept getting ahead of us. So Kennedy, launched the initiative, which became NASA, in order to um, compete with the Russians. And it was truly a, a race for um, dominance in space. And so that's kind of how it was. And we in NASA kept getting further and further behind and beaten by the Russians. And it was kind of a Hail Mary pass when we decided to go to the moon to put them behind us. Do you feel that NASA or our space program got lax occasionally when, so, so we beat the Russians to the moon, we slowed down or backed off a little bit, uh, almost to see what 
the world's next plan was going to be for space and we didn't stay up with the times or we didn't we, we waited for someone else to do something before we got really interested in doing it in space um well there's some truth to that what what really happened i think is uh in the nixon era that's when we went to the moon and then but if you remember at the time or you probably don't but at the time the country was facing vietnam vietnam got started under the kennedy administration and then it got johnson had it and then uh, nixon had it and then uh, so that was a big big deal all the the protests for the vietnam war were going on there was a lot of civil rights unrest going on um, and a lot of turmoil in the country where um, you know the uh, JFK was assassinated, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, um, <clears throat> and uh, terrible things were happening. Um, then um, Nixon had his Watergate, so and and so there was a huge political warfare going on between the parties and in the uh, in the culture at the time. And so from, from Nixon's point of view, uh, he had a lot of bigger fish to fry than to focus on the space program, as did Congress. Um, so the, and it was a non-military program. So the emphasis kind of diverted from the space program into more domestic problems. And, um, and then, and so it languished and, um, and, then, and then it became kind of a political football for a number of years. They came up with a, uh, the, the national, the, what do they call it? National NST, National Space Transportation System was a big plan that was put out there. Um, forget which administration put it out there, but it was a, it was a huge plan that included the shuttle, um, a space station, um, orbital transfer vehicles, uh, going to the moon. It was huge, um, very comprehensive. Um, and, uh, and then it, it suffered from lack of funding. And, and the funding problem what occurred because Congress um, had cho or the country had chosen to put NASA in the private sector. And so NASA was com competing with um, entitlements for its funding rather than military. So a congressman could say, well, we got a choice of giving milk to the, to the babies or paying for NASA. So they made the choice of taking care of babies. When, when, Making your just, I, I want to know how what the process was for you to get your job, the interview process to get your job at NASA, and what you know. You think I think now of a uh, uh, Western Electric in, in Indianapolis, for for example, that you know it's some of those. It's it, it's going to it's going to be stable. It's going to be around forever. Of course, it, it wasn't stable. It's gone. Uh, you know, uh, technology it caught up with them, or they didn't stay up with technology. Uh, and no, and knowing how NASA at, at times can be a a, a political um, football that gets played with the politicians, what did you see as did you see any stability issues with uh, uh, going to work for NASA, or did you think well you know if there are I'm, it, 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 this is what I want to do, and we'll just come to those when it's time that when we have to come to those. Um, there was. NASA was a stable program as far as I was concerned um, <clears throat> because I was a civil servant. Uh, what would happen is um, as a political football, it, it was a funding issue where monies would come and go, programs would come and go. Um, it's, but the, the NASA as a entity was gonna remain. <clears throat> so I was pretty comfortable with that. Uh, although they did have, just before I came on board was 
I came on board about the time, full time, about the time NASA was going down. Um, they had completed the Apollo program and they were reducing, reducing the numbers and uh, budgets were going down. And so there were uh, people who, there was a reduction in force. And so some people got laid off, but they were primarily contractors. <clears throat> a few civil servants had what was called a reduction in grade, where they may have been at one pay level and they got reduced uh, pay grade. Um, so that was hard for them, but they still had their job. And um, that's kind of, that's kind of, and, and civil servants just never made very much money anyway. So it wasn't like you're going to get rich working for the space program. So is it something that, come on in, come on in, Edward, come on in, have a seat. All right. I'm, I'm going to ask you these three questions. Okay. You're hired. We're going to start you here. And uh, uh, I got, can you move to Houston? I mean, how did, you know, what were those, happen? were those steps? Was it that easy? Uh, no, it was easier actually. Um, when I uh, was at college, I got into the cooperative education program. And um, I wanted to work for NASA. So I applied through the co-op program to NASA. I was given an offer very soon to go to the Marshall Space Flight Center. And, but I hadn't heard back from Johnson Space Center. And I really wanted to go to the Manned Space Flight Center. And um, so, I waited and waited to the very last moment and I was just about to accept Marshall when uh, Houston came through and said, yeah, we have a place for you here. <clears throat> so that's how it happened. And it, it was a simple written application and going through my, my counselor there um, at Purdue. Once you're in the program and you go through it and you graduate, um, unless you're a real goof off or, or a poor employee, almost always they offer you a job afterwards. So that's, I just, just stepped right from being a co-op right into uh, being a um, full-time employee. Uh, now people are going to think that there is a working clock still there in mission control where you're at because we hear a clock go off occasionally. So that's, uh, I'm not going to edit that out, by the way. Oh, sorry. I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no. We did that out. No, nah, that's okay. So, so uh, married at the time when you make that trek to Texas, uh, excited, worried. That was interesting. Um, <laughs> that's a long story, but I'll, I'll tell it to you as much as you want to hear. But the bottom line is, is I uh, I was working for a painter in for the summer, who was from Galveston, and his wife's family. Um, were lived in Houston and um, they found out that I was going to go to Houston so um, Elmer's wife Bernice contacted her family and uh, Bernice's niece uh, met me at the airport and um, drove me to Clear Lake City where this Houston facility is and passed me off to a lady there uh, named Connie Kenya, whose husband uh, owned a, a apartment locating service, Texas Apartment Locators, and Connie helped me find a, uh, an efficiency apartment that I could afford right across the street from the Space Center. Um, and uh, so basically mom and dad took me to the airport. I had a suitcase and they put me on airplane to fly to Houston with the hope that this lady, this niece, Sylvia, would meet me at the airport and help me get settled. But I, I went out there with nothing. I had some money in my pocket to pay the first month's rent, uh, but I was really going to need to make money there. So it was kind of, I, I just can't imagine my parents doing that. Apparently it was pretty hard on my mom to watch me wander off like that. Um, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, so 
Yes, it does. But you know, it tell, that first couple of years with NASA, uh, were you glad that you made the decision that you made? Is, is working for NASA, I know this is jumping ahead a little bit, but is working for NASA, do you, did you find some people just doing their job and that's it? Did you feel like you had to uh, reinvent yourself and make yourself a necessity to make sure that you can keep doing what you wanted to do? Um, no, um, I, I loved working for NASA as a co-op. They actually, they sent me out to Ellington Air Force Base at the time where they had um, a fleet of aircraft. Some were the uh, uh, airplanes that the astronauts flew and keep current in and uh, go to and from the Cape or various places that they would go. So there's a fleet of uh, T-38 airplanes. But there's also an Earth Resource uh, Program there where airplanes would um, do reconnaissance over the various resources. They, there was Landsat and they would monitor mosquitoes and oil slicks and all kinds of stuff. It was, it was fascinating. So they had many, many different kinds of airplanes there. They had uh, big cargo planes uh, like, like the C-130 and the KC-135, they had that was the, they called it the Vomit Comet, but that, that was out there. Um, the, they had helicopters and they also had out there what was called the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle. Uh, you can look that up on YouTube and see it fly, but it, they call it a flying bedstead. But it would, it would go up to about 300 feet and then um, throttle back the jet engine and then glide down to the ground, just like the lunar lander. And that was uh, run out of Ellington Field there, or Ellington Air Force Base at the time. And that was, that was really exciting to, to be a part of that. Um, so I, you know, I was around airplanes and I got to climb all over airplanes and uh, and at Ellington is Air Force Base. There were tons of different type of military aircraft come through there. Um, it was fun, exciting times. Uh, and then, um, then when I graduated, uh, the shuttle program was picking up. And so instead of remaining out at Ellington, they transferred me into the um, mission control, flight control uh, organization where I got to work um, on the, uh, they call it space lab, but they were flying space lab. They're designed and develop testing space lab and um, the flight controllers would define the requirements uh, for various components so that they, they had a good interface with the, with the ground as well as um, with the crew. So I worked in, in flight control there um, I, I, they allowed me to go work the console for Skylab reentry back in 79. Uh, that was when Skylab, that's when we managed to land Skylab on Australia. And um, then uh, from that, uh, they moved me to the remote manipulator, the, the bionic arm that the Canadians built. And uh, I went from there. What's it like being on a team like for the arm for the space shuttle program? Um, are there a lot of egos? Did you guys all have to work together? Did you guys already learn to work together? Uh, did you have to tiptoe around? Was there a lot of, and I know I'm expanding this question because I have other questions once I'm asking you a question. Was there a lot of political tiptoeing you had to do around? You know, tell me about the teamwork at NASA. Um, that is probably NASA's strength um, in in flight control. Um, I'm not. I can't. I'm not going to speak to engineering or life sciences or any of the others. I'm going to talk specifically flight control. Teamwork was was it, and good communications. Um, you had to be able to communicate. You had to first. You had to know your your system, so you had to know your stuff. Um, the Mission Control Center was not a place where you could 
make mistakes. Um, so you really had to be on your game. Um, sure, there's politics and maneuvering for various positions, but when it came to the mission, it was all business, and um, and you had to you had to have just really good communication skills. Um, you know, one of the things that we that we did do was we spent huge amounts of time being trained. You had to spend time learning your systems. Uh, we had to develop our own systems handbooks and our own um, train, uh, packages. Our, we called them goodie books, but they were the books that had our, our special notes in them. Um, and um, you had to learn how the, the control system worked, mission control, because that was your tool to um, interface with your system on orbit. Um, and back in those days, we didn't have, we only had mainframe computers. We didn't have PCs or anything like that. So you really had to, it was, it was, um, it was difficult. Um, and um, as the, uh, the remote manipulator was not as, uh, what's the word? Um, primary, when it wasn't a life or death system like like the engines or the boosters or anything like that. So it was more of a, a payload. So it was it it was a second class citizen for in the control center for getting um, getting its displays developed. So for a long time, our displays in the control system were just ones and zeros uh, that you watched, rather than um, being um, a full-on display like you would see today. So, um, um, so yeah, it was there was it was a lot of hard work. Um, it was a good sense of accomplishment. There was a lot of camaraderie. Um, at the end of a mission, they had uh, in the in the Gemini, Mercury, Apollo eras when at the end of a mission they had what they called a splashdown party where where the whole city would celebrate um at the return of the SNN. i mean the whole the whole city including houston they'd have ticker tape parades and everything and parties that would go on for days um and then during the shuttle program the the parties would only last for a couple of days uh, or or a night or so, but nobody celebrated until after they were home, after the crew was home. Uh, so. Speaking of that, and I know you've been, you know, I, I don't think I've ever asked you this question, but I, I know you've probably had to answer it a lot. Um, the Columbia and Challenger disasters, what, what, what did that mean? What, how did that affect you? How did it affect NASA each when, when each one of those disasters happened? And uh, how quickly did you guys bounce back? And did you bounce back better than what you guys started out with? Well, um, let's go back to the, the fire, the Apollo fire. Um, when I, I'd come there, that was history. Um, but I, um, I was trying to, uh, I built, I designed, developed, tested, built, um, some equipment that was going to fly on the shuttle. And I wanted to fly it in a plastic bag, one of those Ziploc bag kind of things. Um, and they sent me over to the guy in engineering who was an expert in materials and materials that would fly on the shuttle. And uh, I asked him about flying it in a bag. Why couldn't I fly it in a plastic bag? And, uh, cause it's cheaper that way. And he, he raked me up one side and down the other about safety and how um, until I personally had sat at the, at, at, at the console and listened to those guys um, calling out for help during the fire. 
and realized that what I wanted to fly was a fire hazard in space, um, I needed to shut my mouth and listen to the guys with the experience. And so that was a, that, that death was, those deaths was significant um, event in the lives of the, of all of NASA. Similarly, in the Challenger accident, that was um, some uh, uh, poor decisions that were made by uh, some of the managers. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, on the Columbia accident, there were uh, poor decisions that were made that led up to that. Um, uh, the um, there's a there's a principle called the Swiss cheese model on on accidents and the, the the model is if you look at a piece of Swiss cheese just a slice of it it's full of holes but if you look at a big wedge of Swiss cheese you don't normally be able to see all the way through it even though it's got holes in it unless all those holes happen to line up just right. And then you can see all the way through the piece of Swiss cheese. Well, in most accidents, people don't want to have an accident. So they put things in place to prevent them. And um, so every once in a while, all the, the, the preventive, accident, preventive uh, things that are in place are, um, um, line up that enable the accident to occur. So, uh, and that happened, that was a case of the Challenger accident. It was a case of the Columbia accident where things that would have, if that one thing would have happened, it would have prevented the accident. And they didn't. And it was, it was tragic. And it, it took because you have to go through the accident investigation and then you have to fix the problems. And so it takes two years to three years after an accident for NASA to get back on track. Um, and in some, in some ways we were better and stronger in other ways, we didn't seem to learn our lesson. Did you think at any point in time during either one of those uh, post disasters that, you know, it, NASA was never going to be back to what it was like, or it was going to be shut down, or uh, did you know that, you know, you guys could uh, better upon the mistakes that were made? Uh, from my perspective, um, and I never doubted that we would be back up and operating. I, I just, I knew we would. Um, NASA had too much to do. We were, for the, on the Columbia accident, we were in the middle of building um, space station. And you, we absolutely had to have the shuttle to build space station. Um, and uh, after the Columbia, uh, the Challenger accident, we were, that was probably the one that was a little more dicey as far as getting back and up or going, but, but we were committed to moving forward in the space program. What was it like for you or, you know, others that you worked with that there are things that you were doing for the space program for NASA that you may not have seen come to fruition, or there's things that you worked on before you retired that haven't happened yet. How, how do you put that in perspective with a, a, a career uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> It's it's a weird. I know it's a weird question, but you, you, sometimes you were working on stuff that just didn't happen for years. Well, that's true. A um, couple of thoughts on that. One is, um, I think in life, um, a lot of things we do are for the future generation. Um, you know, you you try and make a life better for your kids and your grandkids. You try to do things that will make their, make it better for them. Um, and even though you know you won't, you won't see the fruition of it, you'd do it anyway. It's kind of like planting a, a fruit bearing tree that isn't gonna bear fruit 
but for your children or your grandchildren. Um, and so that's a lot of what kind of the perspective is. You, um, and, and there's, there's a poem or something, but it talks about how um, people stood on the shoulders of giants in order to get to where they are today. And, and you know, the, you had the Wright brothers that, that built the airplane. Um, you had Goddard that built the rocket. You had the first astronauts that, that took that risk flying into space. You had, and so it's just, it's kind of that way. And technology seems to be that way. Everything is um, kind of just a little step, a little step, and then you can build more and more on that. The headphones you're wearing, they didn't, somebody didn't start out that way. They start out as tinny speakers back in the, with Alexander Graham Bell, <laughs> you know. So what do you think, how do you, what hands do you think the space program is in today? Is it, is it just as good and solid when you took, when you were uh, working for NASA? Do you think it's in good hands going in the future? And what do you think about the space startup programs? And I know they're not startups anymore, but, you know, uh, 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 working hand in hand with NASA. And how do you feel about space today? I have thought for a long time that the uh, private industry needed to get more and more involved in space. You know, if you think back to when the um, Wright brothers flew, which was what, 1902, 01, something like that. Um, within 40 years would be 1942, we were using airplanes to carry mail. We were using airplanes in in warfare, we were using airplanes to carry passengers around. Um, they're doing barnstorming, um, all of that in 40 years. So if you look at say the 1959, early 50, late 50s was when Sputnik went up. If you, um, if you look at 40 years from there, that would put it at, in the 1990s early 2000s and we, we they didn't have much of a private industry going into space. Um, most of our private industry was putting up satellites for, um, oh, for telecommunications and for um, uh, weather observation. And a lot of that was help government funding. So I, I'm thrilled that they're getting involved. It's, it's kind of like it's about time and NASA needed to turn over the low earth orbit stuff to private industry and go on and further go to Mars, go to the moon, figure out how to, how to survive on the moon and then figure out how to survive on Mars and, and do the deep space robotics things that we've got going. I like, I like those programs. I'm not asking you if you believe in UFOs or aliens, but what what do you believe is out there on mars is there do you think there's living things do you think uh what, what do you think it's it, it it's a, a kind of hard to fathom something that far out and finding more and more about it i i would be very very surprised if we actually find life on mars um, I, th I think um, the delicate balance and all the myriad of things that have to come together to support life on this planet um, is incredible. And, um, and one of the things is where we are in the solar system, the distance we are from the sun. Um, the moon that we have going around us. Uh, and Mars doesn't have those things. Um, can it support life? That's something that we need to go there and figure out. It would be, I think we may be able to create um, domes and places like that where we, could, where we could live. And there may be lots of material, minerals and such that we can harvest from 
from Mars. So I think we should go there. But do I think we'll find life there? I would be surprised. Um, and one, one thing I like to, to ask people who ask me about, well, you know, about aliens or whatever, you know, some life has to be the very first. Maybe it's us. Maybe we're the very first. There is no other body, and there's no other life out there and, except for us. And because somebody has to be first, why not us? Did you ever get the, this question was not on the list either. So I apologize. Here comes a knuckleball. Did you ever get the opportunity to take any of the tests or did you want to take any of the tests that those who went into space astronauts had to take? You know, uh, did you did you get the float uh, uh, um, with zero gravity? Did you take any of the? Did you get to go in the thing that goes around and around and around and around? Did you get the opportunity or want to do any of those tests just to know what it was like uh, for an astronaut to go uh, to be trained to go through that? Um, I I although I had opportunity, um, I didn't take it. Um, for lots of different reasons. Um, primarily because at that time I was having some heart issues and it would have wasn't a good idea for me to do that. Um, but I did get to, uh, there's a airplane called the shuttle training aircraft. It's a Grumman G3, G2 that um, was configured to fly, simulate a shuttle landing. Uh, and they do that out at uh, White Sands. And uh, I, and that flew out of Ellington Field. So I was, I got to fly on that a few times. That was, that was more fun than a roller coaster ride for sure. Um, and in order to fly on the planes, you have to go through um, survival training. And so I went through survival training, which any crew member would have to do. And so a lot of the training that the astronauts would go through uh, were the uh, survival training, anything that any aircraft crew member would take. Um, plus, I, I went ahead and got trained on, on all the shuttle systems um, as any flight crew member would have to take. We took the same training the same courses as any flight crew member would take. Um, so we got, I got all that training. Um, so that was, I don't know, that's. Did, did, did your love for space and what your passion for what you do, did that trickle down to any of your three um, uh, daughters or grandkids? I think, um, well, I have a grandson that, that wants to go into, uh, wants to go to Purdue and get a aeronautical and astronautical degree there. Um, so we'll see whether he's, he actually does that or not. Um, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> my daughters growing up where they did and you know, they were kind of jaundiced towards NASA it was kind of ho-hum. Uh, we'd already gone to the moon. We'd already done that. They, they knew lots of astronauts and astronauts' kids, and um, they, just, they just didn't care. I think they're, they're proud to be a part of it. They, they've grown up where they're not, um, they don't, they're not thrilled with um, celebrity. You know, they, they don't have stars in their eyes towards any celebrities. Uh, they're just people that walk around, put on their pants one leg at a time, like everybody else. So I don't know the trickle down. Yeah. I, I, I look at some of my stuff and I go, man, I need to get rid of it now because my kids are just going to throw it in the trash. <laughs> so you retired early. Did you, was there, did, did, did you plan on that once you got as far as you got, I mean, 37 years is a long time to work and, and you retired, you still had, 
and, and so what, what was your decision? I mean, I, I asked this of uh, basketball players and athletes that are on the show is that, was it hard hanging up your tennis shoes and not playing the game anymore? How hard was it for you um, to leave NASA and not create a new life, but live a, new, a different and new life? Um, it was not hard. Uh, I, I had been there. Um, NASA had changed quite a bit from the time I started to to time I retired. Um, and I had I had worked in many, many different jobs uh, from aircraft operations to flight operations to uh, engineering, program office to uh, the safety world. Um, and then in safety world, it was in quality and safety. And then I got into the budget kind of stuff. Um, and I realized that the, the programs were really for uh, younger people. You know, they, I, I had seen the older guys, the Chris Crafts and the, um, those type folks who would say, you know, it's time for the young folks to take over. And so they would step aside. Gene Kranz would be one. Um, uh, and uh, I really, yeah, it, you, you step aside for younger people. You've been doing it long enough and you need fresh ideas and things. And so um, I was, it was time. And I was, and I looked forward to doing something completely different. And so that's, so that was kind of how I, how I approached it. Do I, I miss it? Yeah, every once in a while, I think, yeah, it sure would be fun to get back and work the console again. I, I would probably be a lot better at it now than I was then because I, I'd be a lot more relaxed and not so uptight about it. Um, but yeah, what, just a funny story. I can cut this out if you want. But anyway, I worked with a fella who was not suited to work on a console. We were in, in mission control, there's the back room guys who monitor everything. And then there's the front room guys in mission control who coordinate what all goes on in the back rooms. Well, this guy was in the back room and we were just during doing simulations and the poor guy, he, he would stand there and he would stand on one foot and then another going back and forth and back and forth, just waiting to push his button to tell somebody what was going on. And so he, uh, so it was driving us crazy. Well, one of the other fellas would say to him, oh, I think I see this problem here. And that guy would punch that button and say to the front room, oh, I think we have a problem here. And then the original guy would say, oh, sorry, my mistake. And so then he'd have to get back on the, on the mic and say, oops, it was nothing. And so they just, and he, it happened he fell for it every single time it was finally he realized everybody realized he just was he was too nervous just wasn't right for him he was and he was a really good engineer and the same questions that i asked two of uh, my other guests do you still do you guys still stay in touch is there uh, uh you know now we have social media you know, do you guys still stay in touch? Is there, uh, do you guys e email each other? Do you, uh, do you got, would you got, are you guys going to have, would there be reunions of um, uh, your uh, people that you worked with and for, or um, how, you know, or is it just, you know, moved on? Well, there's, uh, there are, we do keep in touch um, with coworkers. Every once in a while, when we go back to uh, Houston, we'll um, um, have dinner or get together. Um, there's uh, two organizations. One is a retired guys organization for all the all the retirees. They get together monthly for uh, they have a big luncheon. Uh, they've gotten pretty big now. They take over almost a whole cafeteria there. Um, and then there's the uh, Mission Control guys have a uh, all the guys that ever worked in Mission Control. We get together, um, and um, so we have reunions. In fact, we were going to have one next month, 
but they chose not to because of the resurgence of the of the virus there in Houston. So, uh, but yeah, we get together. It's a good, good group, um, and lots of large group. It's fun to see guys you haven't seen in twenty years. Thirty-seven years with NASA, um, and I need to do a show on sayings and where they came from. But I'm, I'm believing this is just the tip of the iceberg. But um, and uh, I did full disclosure at the beginning of the show that this is my uncle Joe Ritma, who worked for NASA for thirty-seven years. Um, uh, uncle Joe, or let me be a little bit Joe or Mr. Ritma. Thank you so much for your time and like I. I I, we may have we may have to do another one depending on how uh, uh, how people like this, but uh, I, I enjoyed it. I thank you so much. Well, you're so welcome. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about the space program, nephew Bill. 